Testing, testing, sound check. Mighty Rat is first, and hey Dave Williams, could you let me know how we sound? Hello, Carlos. Welcome. Okay, this is Steve at Little Treasury. And uh, welcome you all to our show this uh, Thursday, May 7th at uh, 5 p.m., as promised. And uh, looks like my sound's a bit low. I will crank it up a little bit, see if that works a little better. How's that? Okay, Stiefel also says I'm low, and let's see if that's any better. Okay, so uh, I see 11 are watching, so it uh, looks like this might be a popular show. I have uh, a special guest that I've invited to come aboard, and uh, he will be Skyping in shortly, and hopefully everything will go smoothly. And his name is uh, Dr. Michael LaBellarte. And uh, Michael's been a uh, customer and a friend, become a good friend of ours and mine. And uh, as a psychiatrist, I want to assure you that I am not his customer. So uh, merely his friend. So uh, let's see if we have uh, Lance is here. Hi, uh, Der Stiefel and Tim McDonald. So people are coming aboard and uh, hopefully uh, Dr. La Bellarte will be uh, checking in with us shortly. Um, I know we had a whole uh, set of appointments this afternoon uh, ending at five, so he may uh, take a minute to get, uh, get with us. So, uh, okay, Lance, sound is good for him also. I've uh, been trying to tune up our act, gotten some comments, and uh, we take them to heart, and uh, we try to do the best with our technology. Uh, this we're set up as aspirational, and we uh, are trying to live up to what we have here, and sometimes it doesn't work, and sometimes it does, and uh, with limited time to prep, and often customers coming in as we want to get started, uh, things get uh, a little bit confused. So uh, that is what is going on. And uh, let me flip back to this uh, piece uh, that I had on the screen. And this, of course, is the uh, blue snowflake. And uh, I thought it uh, matched, well, number one, we have it on a uh, bracelet. Uh, as you probably know, it uh, comes on a uh, uh, crocodile or alligator strap. Uh, we need to go and check the uh, uh, hairs on the uh, various uh, uh, scales, as uh, Craig has pointed out, to see exactly what we have there. Uh, but we've uh, mounted it on a Grand Seiko bracelet here, and uh, we can also sell it that way. So um, that is uh, uh, something we can do. And I thought also that it matched well with uh, the mask behind it. So if you're interested in color coordinating uh, and you're wearing one of these light blue masks, uh, this is a good pairing. And that might even be a gift with purchase. So, okay, Kyle is saying I'm a little low on audio. And... Uh, Carlos says, to his eyes, Grand Seiko without loom looks better as uh, highlight, uh, it highlights the finishing. And uh, yeah, it does stand alone very well without the, uh, the loom, I would say. And this is uh, certainly a beautiful piece. <laughs> OK, 
Okay, uh, we're bringing aboard our guest, and I'm going to switch over and uh, show this gentleman. And uh, I am going to work on the volume a bit. Uh, so let me first uh, bring aboard uh, uh, Dr. Michael Labellarte, and he is over here. Uh, hi, Michael. Uh, how are you? Hey, how are you doing? Good. You're seeing me? And I, uh, I'm let me, seeing uh, you on the Skype. I'm not seeing you yet. Uh, okay. Uh, you're seeing me on Skype. Well, that's where you should pay attention to Skype. Uh, you need to forget that or you're going to get um, a time lag that uh, you're not going to like. So just keep, uh, keep watching. So uh, we have... Uh, uh, 22 people watching. Uh, I've given a little uh, introduction of our uh, friendship and uh, 10 years together now. And uh, it's been an interesting ride indeed. So uh, just a little introduction from the watch side for you. And uh, it looks like uh, since you've been with us, you've uh, bought heavily ball watch. Uh, for a number of years, then you got into Zanetti watches from Rome, uh, then into Bremont, and uh, got into some pens from Monte Grappa, and uh, you've picked up a Panerai uh, pre-owned from us, a Rolex sub, uh, an Omega uh, gray side of the moon from someone else, I think originally from us perhaps, and now you're dipping into Grand Seiko with a passion. So you've had quite a ride. And uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about uh, your broader collecting habits, because I think uh, everybody's probably curious about what's behind you. <laughs> yeah, this is um, 50 years in the making. Um, I started collecting comic books in 1972, um, just for fun. Here's a copy of my first comic ever. And this is uh, Captain Marvel number 28, cover date of September, and I know that's 1972, and if the uh -huh. cover date's September, it probably came out in June. By the way, signed by the author, um, Jim Starlin, who's the inventor of Thanos, in case you've watched those movies that have come out. So I like to collect comics because I like, to, I like the stories. And then over time, um, literally 50 years, I've been able to accumulate a fair number of superhero-related artifacts. And people always say, you know, why would you want a superhero artifact? And the answer is, why not? Um, watches are funny, and, and, and comics are funny in the same way. Watches help you tell time. But what's interesting, the reason I held this up, is my whole life I've been able to tell you time based on these cover dates. So if this came out in June of 1972, I can tell you where I bought it. I can tell you I was with my mom. I can tell you I walked a half a mile down the street to Cassidy Drug Store. I can tell you everything about that day because my memory works chronologically and it, and it works uh, sort of photographically based on image. So I can look at that image and I can tell you that day in, in history. So now I have had about 20,000 comic books. Mm -hmm. And so that I can keep time according to the collection, which is really weird. And what utility mm -hmm. is that? It turns out that the more I learn about heroes and superheroes and the so-called hero's journey, the more I appreciate the stories that people tell me in the office. I'm a psychiatrist, child psychiatrist specifically. And I find that people tell me narratives based on the meaning in their lives. And oftentimes people show up because something's wrong. For instance, uh, here we are in the middle of a pandemic. It's easy to lose your job. It's easy mm -hmm. to use your, lose your anchors. It's, it's easy to be grieving uh, sick or dead people. And what people are often looking for is the quest for meaning. So whether or not it's a movie that came out or just what I know about the journey that people take, uh, call to duty, obstacles, tutors, um, until they can reach a point where they can make different decisions. Um, I find meaning in a lot of different things. And what I'm learning about myself is I find meaning in things, not because I buy things impulsively, but because I can tell you the story about the things that I like to collect. So does this translate to your watch collecting in, in what way? Sure, so absolutely. Yeah. Let's hear it. So I can tell you a couple of things. I, I've been setting up my props. And so I have a number of really cool watches. Um, I always have to look. What am I wearing today? Today I'm wearing my Vermont Boeing. I'm going to take this off so you can look at it closer. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. And so this is a Vermont special edition Boeing. Mm -hmm. And I got this several years ago. I got it on the anniversary of my father's death. My father was a machinist and my father worked as a machinist for about 60 years. And he worked um, in precision airplane parts, worked for Boeing, worked for Lockheed, worked for the Department of Defense. And so I've been to his office many times. He's brought me home um, gadgets that he's made and inscribed with my initials on it. I know about titanium work. And so this watch slays me because it is absolutely beautiful. And it has this coining on it. And so what do I know about it? Well, I know that my father would use a lathe. And I know that my father would use a jig bore in order to make precision parts. And he'd mm. spend a half an hour setting it up just to make a bur just to make a burp uh, or, or a hole in the metal. And so um, people say that I do funny things when I look at objects. Steve's aware of how I look at things. Absolutely. People that know me think I'm a little bit peculiar. Mm. I stare at things. And I don't know if I inherited it from my father or if I that's just my temperament and my proclivity for detail. But when I look at things, I'm memorizing them, and I'm looking for uh, things that are inaccurate or imbalanced. And so my father did the same thing. And so I absolutely love these curves and these grooves and the, the, the color of the titanium because I'm so familiar with it growing up. As such, this watch is very meaningful to me because it reminds me of my father. And um, I have several um, interesting things here, um, mm. if I could tell you a couple more. This is a really unusual watch. It, as far as I know, does not have any monetary value. This is a Senrus. I've never heard of it before. S-E-N-R-U-S. It's got a plastic cover. It's probably from 1970 or so. This happened to be the watch my grandfather, my maternal grandfather, Vito Leonardo Massa, was wearing when he passed away. And he wore it for about 10 years. He was probably 98 when he passed mm -hmm. away. And for some reason, my mother decided to give me this watch. And she said, I know you always like watches. And so here's this thing, this item, this object of absolute power that I can grab it and I can tell you where I was in holy Toledo. I don't wear this watch because, you know, it doesn't work, but it is alongside all my pre uh, precious ones. Yeah, here's cool. another great one. And uh, this one has really a, a couple resonances, a couple different um, uh, importances, meanings to me. This is a 1959 gold Lord Elgin that I've never worn, by the way. This is the original strap, crocodile strap, absolutely beautiful. And it is inscribed on the back to my grandfather on my father's side. His name was Francesco Francis or Francis Labalarte. And it, uh, he went by Frank at work. So it's inscribed by the Ford Motor Company to Frank Labalarte in a 35-year anniversary of working at the Ford Motor Company. <clears throat> he ended up in 1958, and it's signed and medaled by um, Henry Ford. My brother's name is Francis, or Frank, and so he and I have talked about this watch literally for 50 years, and lately he let me borrow it so I can just look at it. Um, I, I got a zillion of these stories, and that's what I find interesting about watches. Watches have great stories. Okay, so um, uh, Boozer, one of our uh, fellows here, says, Doctor, why is it that we tell ourselves that we just need one more watch to complete our collection, but after we get it, we start lusting after another one? Well, I, I got to tell you, I'm laughing because I was thinking that exact same thing today. Um, I find uh, that, you know, I kind of memorize the order that I buy the watches. And, and let me pull one out here. It's one of my favorites. I bought three watches initially. And I said to myself, I'm buying the three that I want because that's it. I am never buying another watch again. And so I bought, Steve, you probably remember what I bought. I remember I the whole thing. Ball. Yeah. yeah. And I bought a titanium ball and I bought a train master of the black enamel face. And I said, that's it. The three styles of watch and that's it. I will never need another one. Well, lo and behold, then one more came along. <laughs> why do we do it? I'm telling you why yeah. I do it, then I'll tell you why I think we do it. Inevitably, you see another one that has meaning in it. So I think the next one I bought, the fourth one, was probably a Vermont. It was probably the Terra Nova, which is absolutely beautiful. I was wearing that earlier today. Then finally, I said, that's it. I do not need another one. And then I came across this gold ball, and I got one gold ball, but then you, uh, you pointed me in the direction of the doctor's watch. Right. And so there's an old saying in medical school 
that the better you become at being a physician, less gadgets you need. So, you know, there are doctors that walk around with stethoscopes and other kind of things and they order tests. But when I trained many years ago, 35 years ago, it was a matter of uh, great pride that you didn't have a doctor bag. In fact, if you had a good enough memory, you never needed a pen. The only thing you needed was a nice watch because to this day, I check pulses 20 times a day. And so I finally found an ideal watch that I could check the pulse, use the pulsometer, press the button, it helps me calculate. So On the other hand, this watch is too fancy to wear to work, so it sits in my drawer. Ah, oh, interesting. So I didn't realize you took pulses uh, in your line of work. That's uh, far from the old couch thing where the uh, shrink didn't get near the, the patient, maybe not even look them in the face. So what's going on with that? <laughs> Well, I have to check pulses because I happen to see a number of patients that require medication treatment. Oh. And a number of our medications um, require that we monitor to make sure pulse is not accelerated or pulse is not low. Mm -hmm. um, so to finish, um, if I may, the, the, the guy's question, why do we always say one more? And so my wife, who's in, in marketing and consumer behavior, always yells at me about, you're never satisfied. You're always going to buy a new one. And it's kind of tongue in cheek because my engine for buying it is because I find that there's a story to be seen. And I don't know what the story is going to be next year that I need a, commem a commemorative. Mm -hmm. It's going to be my commemorative of this time of year. But inevitably, I like to find a commemorative thing. So the number one is my understanding of collecting as, as um, motivated by meaning. But then a lot of us are collectors, too. And collectors are funny because they're completists. And completist is a whole different ballpark. Uh, a lot of people say things like compulsive. You are a compulsive watch buyer. And I don't like the word compulsive. Compulsive literally is a word that refers to um, repetitive behavior designed to decrease anxiety. And so an obsession by definition is an anxious, repetitive, anxious worry. And a compulsion is supposed to be there to assuage the repetitive, anxious worry. So then people will say, well, I buy the watch, for instance, I buy a watch. Because if I don't buy the watch, I'll be nervous because I want it. <clears throat> Many collectors uh, research, find, hold, memorize, think about, actually think about not buying a watch for about three months before I actually buy it. I try to talk myself out of it. But the idea of collectors is they're just driven by a different engine. It's not obsessively compulsive, but it is repetitive. And it's driven by, I, I, I had to invite this, invent this word. It doesn't fit, but it kind of fits. It's a passion. Um, it is driven by the energy that's a passion, and the passion in this case meaning enthusiasm. We are enthusiasts, and you like watches because you like watches, and we're collectors, and the way you know you're not a collector is if you have one watch. So if I can tell you this great story, I was at a swim meet about six months ago in Anne Arundel County, and I was wearing an antique uh, Rolex GMT, and I was standing... Um, next to 8 million people. I was standing next to a guy about my age and his hand was on the rail watching my, the, our daughter swim. My hand was on the rail and he was literally wearing a Rolex Submariner from the same timeline. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm aware that most men do not like strangers commenting about the watch. <clears throat> so I had to measure it to see how I thought he would gauge it. Excuse me. <clears throat> and I said to him, my goodness, that's a beautiful watch. I'm wearing a similar watch. What's that from, 1967? And he stopped everything. He turned and looked me in the eye, and he said, tell you the truth, this is a 1965 Submariner. My uncle wore this in Vietnam. When he died, he bequeathed it to me. I didn't even think the guy liked me. And this is the most beautiful thing I've ever seen. I've never taken it off, and I will never wear another watch. Now, that's a guy who appreciates meaning. But that's not a watch collector. No. He is a believer in relationships and stories. Right. Okay, we've got another question here. This might be a little tongue-in-cheek. Uh, are you familiar with Archie Luxury? Say it again, Archie. Archie Luxury. Archie Luxury. He's a, a, a YouTube uh, uh, a person who does watches, who's a little over the top. And I guess they're looking. Oh, I, I'm not familiar. They're looking for a diagnosis, so maybe you can watch uh, watch them a few times and come back on and give us the uh, final answer. Somebody says here, uh, Archie Luxury's diagnosis is brain damage. So, uh, <laughs> all right. So another question: 
Uh, doctor, does it make sense that in almost any decision, we make the decision with our guts first and we rationalize it later, usually using uh, suffering uh, confirmation by bias, I guess the word is, yeah. <laughs> now, it's easy to paint in broad stripes, and it's really easy to paint in broad stripes when there's a sampling bias. So um, the person who wrote that, um, I'm going to take a guess as a man. Um, um, why? Because that's something that I tend to bump into men 99 out of 100 times when I'm at the watch store or I'm looking at watch events. Um, that is a very guy kind of question, um, <laughs> and it is a, based on a very guy kind of pursuit of the world. So whether or not you're a psychiatrist or you've been to see a psychiatrist, you've probably had this conversation talking about romance. Um, men often um, find themselves um, attracted to a person, and men, because of whatever biological thing, also find themselves attracted to objects sometimes. And of course it's very different, and it's not analogous, but it's kind of analogous. Because what men t tend to do is they tend to be attracted to their partners based on a couple different things. One, they are looking for someone that is physically appealing to them, not necessarily what everyone would agree is the most beautiful person, but based on what they find valuable because of, guess what, genetic need to reproduce. So men are attracted to women that they want to reproduce with, which is interesting. And so then it's the same kind of things. They're staring, there's the feeling in their stomach, there's nervous, uh, try to talk yourself out of it. But inevitably, you tend to match. It's called social matching. You socially match with a person that roughly intellectually and physically attractive, whatever that even means, symmetrical in most cultures. You find someone that's about equivalent to you that you want to reproduce with, and then you fall in love with them. But it's weird. You fall in love. Men tend to fall in love based on physicality. And men, as much as we can criticize ourselves for being foolish in many ways, men tend to be accepting of personalities as long as they're attracted to the physicality. So why did you marry that person? Why'd you date that person? Because I love them. Well, they're mean. Well, I can put up with that. I love them. And so <laughs> men tend to make decisions on the front end based on what they think is a good adaptive move, and then they tend to rationalize it on the back end. And I can crack up about this because I've literally sat across from a psychiatrist. I've literally, literally sat across from uh, people who are divorcing. I've had this conversation in 10 different ways. But it is interesting. Um, it is a strangely possessive thing to be in love. It is a strangely possessive thing to, quote, covet a watch or anything that you collect. And it is true that sometimes you just feel like you connect to it. Maybe it's real. Maybe it's artificial. But then once you have it, sometimes you say, see, I always needed to have this watch. And sometimes you have a different kind of bias where there's like a regret. Oh, I needed that other bias, but not uh, that other watch, but not this watch. And then you sort of question your, your commitment to the, uh, the item that you bought. So it's fascinating. But what we see uh, really frequently is uh, men coming in and uh, wrestling with the purchase decision. And every day when we're open to normal traffic, probably five times a day, we hear the phrase, my wife will kill me. Okay. So, <laughs> so what's that? It's, it's like I'm cheating on my wife. I'm going to put something over on her. Uh, there's definitely this little dance. Uh, and it resonates very much so with the wife. And it's not just a money my share of the money issue. It's it's really a little game that goes on. And then the rarity is the endorsing wife, the wife who comes in and supports everything about the, the purchase and uh, or the, the fellow says, oh, my wife definitely wants me to get the watch. This is like one out of 20. <laughs> I love it. Yeah. I, that, that's very near and dear to my house. My, my yeah, I know, I brought that up. <laughs> I know that very well. Yeah. <laughs> Interesting, huh? So, uh, uh, so Carlos, uh, who asked that uh, question you just answered, my wife cannot watch this. And then he's smiling. And then uh, uh, Chi Town, California, uh, that might explain why men pursue sadomasochistic relationships with unreliable but beautiful Italian and British cars. <laughs> Yeah, that one's hard. It's a lot harder to hide that car than to hide a watch. Right, right. 
uh, watch can end up in the office drawer, right? But uh, not so much. Uh, uh, Gifu Natiepo asks, or are you a doctor in cosmo cosmic <laughs> comic bookology as well? I like to think of myself as one. Um, I, I have read an extraordinary number of comics. I have studied them in kind of interesting ways. And I have been writing a book for 15 years, How to Parent Your Superhero, that for some reason I'm always doing other stuff, and then crisis here and crisis there, and I never complete it. But mm -hmm. I know what I think and I know what I write, and so I, I know an awful lot. The most fun I've ever had with comics is really – realizing that the hero's journey that's inherent in any comic book that is written on in great detail by Joseph Campbell, 1947 or so, the overlap is incredible. The psychiatrists from the 60s and 70s like to talk about the life story, about how a person frames their life's journey in terms of what they hoped for, what really happened, and whether or not the expectations were met or not met. And so then that journey, that story is literally the hero's journey uh, that is uh, pointed out in mythology for eons. And yet everybody tells their story the same way. Um, they always remember some special touch moment. There was a call to duty and then there was a need to take action and need to take action as an individual. And then you need to take action and you need to overcome obstacles. And you run into some people who are not so good and they really treat you badly. And then you run into some other people who act as teachers and mentors and, and et cetera. And they give you some really good advice. And then based on the totality of that, you go forward and you conquer. And based on conquering adversity is really the hallmark of resilience and maturity. Now, I could tell that whole story and talk about how every developmental phase for a child, infant to toddler, toddler to et cetera, mm -hmm adolescent to adult is always the hero's journey where the goal is to become independent enough to make that leap. And so um, once those things clicked to me, once I sat in enough lectures hearing people tell their new version of psychiatry, it just really made me laugh about how similar it's been to the, to the intellectual understanding I've had of these darn comic books the whole time. The overlap is astonishing. Um, when I talk about superheroes and people and I try to make it fit, the definition of superhero based on some 1950s court case by Judge Learned Hand, uh, uh, not made up name, was that a superhero had three key components from a legal standpoint. They had to have a distinct identity, they had to have a distinct power set, and they needed to have a distinct mission. And so I could go over a hundred psychiatric psychological philosophers, and I could tell you that the best ones in town uh, talk about concepts like personality, which is roughly akin to identity, and they talk about things like behaviors, adaptive behaviors, maladaptive behaviors, which looks an awful lot like powers and vulnerabilities, abilities and vulnerabilities, kryptonite, for instance. Mm. And then they talk about the life's journey, which is truly just the hero's journey. And um, then when things go awry, it tends to be for some other reason. And so in comic books, the thing that goes bad is villainy. The hero's journey fails and you become a villain. In real life, nobody's literally a villain can i boldly say that but mm -hmm. things go awry sometimes and maybe my brain says when things go terribly awry emotionally or psychiatrically it's really based on a disease of some sort as opposed to an, an injury of the journey that makes people truly whatever okay. so thanks uh another question uh, uh tim mcdonald asked do you enjoy japanese animation it's interesting i do enjoy it but it, it has never picked up momentum for me so I've read some of the books and I've, and I've watched some of the movies. Um, I love Evangelion. Um, it's a little bit uh, opaque. It's hard for me to follow the rhythm of it. Maybe I'm a little too old and I miss that. And I'm too in, in, inured in the American style of animation and reading. But the stories are really are incredible. And it, what's funny is I hear about it because young people tell me about them all the time. So anything I do know, it's not from actual consumption of the product. It's from hearing a young person, a teenager or a young adult tell me great stories because there really is, that really is a rich source of stories and powerful myth um, that cannot be ignored. Okay, great. So uh, Dr. La Bellarte, uh, do you have any watch collecting tips for people who tend to display addictive or obsessive tendencies? Come and see I, Steve. <laughs> Uh, let me give you an example. 
So I would, first of all, include your spouse in this. There's no sense buying something that you value because it's A, expensive, beautiful, meaningful, etc. Resonant, my favorite word. It's not going to resonate if you got to hide it from your spouse or your spouse hates you for doing it. So now you got to bring your spouse into the decision, and you really have to. So when a guy says to you, Steve, uh, I can't do it, my wife will kill me. It's usually based on some calculus that I've already talked to my spouse about this, mm. and I already got the feedback. And it sounded an awful lot like, are you kidding me? And so you can't ask me right now because I've already had this conversation. Mm -hmm. So now if you could get your spouse on board, then you should set your sights on something that can be completed and you will feel complete. And so nobody has endless supply of money. I would love to meet that person or I'd love to be in that experience, but it's never going to happen. And so it would be foolish to open a door of collecting that included things that you cannot collect. Um, I love Long and Sony. I'm not going to ever collect them, but boy, do I love them. I love Podix. Who doesn't? I'm never going to collect them because who can afford to collect them? So now you come down to something you like. I like, uh, I like airplane watches. Um, I like um, special design uh, Zanetti uh, options because they're so personalized. And so if you go with the personalized uh, note, you talk to Zanetti and Francesca, and you say, hey, I want this special watch, that satisfies because it's contained. If you buy uh, the, the Seiko uh, series that, um, that you're always talking about, that I'm always looking at, there's four watches in the connect collection. And which you have two of them, a, by the way. <laughs> which makes them, A, lovely, B, finite. They're reasonably priced for high-end watches. They're absolutely beautiful. And if you buy all four, you get a box. Like, if that's not going to seduce every collector, and now you get the collector's box. Oh, shoot, i got to buy the fourth one now so I can get the box? So advice number one, include your spouse. Advice number two, realize that this is about moving around resources. Don't buy stuff you can't afford. And so if you start with Ball, which is where I started, and I got all the the um, collection that I liked because I, I got just the stuff I liked. And so that's affordable because it's an affordable brand. And then if you're taking a couple steps up, as far as buy four watches that are spectacular and are relatively inexpensive that a person could afford, go with collecting something that has a parameter. That is a collection of four, period. Now, mm -hmm. if you're going to then use that as a stepping stone because now you want to collect all four metals, and now you got to find yourself buying the gold one, and then you <laughs> find yourself buying the platinum one. You may have bid off more than you can chew, but mm -hmm. uh, I'm never going to go down that road. But I wouldn't mind buying four that fit in the box because they're spectacular and they belong to a set. Stick to sets, and then you and your spouse can say beginning, middle, end of the journey, and that really helps. Okay, that's great. So, uh, Yesterday, a guy said he was getting a 34 millimeter Rolex, and other guys criticized him for getting a ladies' watch. Is it common for guys to buy something they don't prefer just to fit in? <laughs> that's interesting. Um, I I think that that's possible, but I got to tell you, literally every guy that I know buys the watch that they like, and they buy it um, because they're kind of. When they show it to you, it's because they think it's perfect. So I, don't know, I do not know a single watch person who says, how do you like my watch? Because, you know, your friends and mine that come into the place, not one of those guys wants in my opinion. They want to mm -hmm. show me that they have a great watch, which I love. You know, um, guys that we know, Stefan, Greg, mm -hmm. holy cow, I love when they show me stuff. They teach mm -hmm. me stuff. I love how it looks on them. It teaches me uh, uh, some stuff and what I'm interested in. But neither of those guys or any guy that I know is saying, what do you think? Should I buy this? Um, these are decisive people who collect. And collectors aren't really asking you for your opinion. And so if you're going to buy something based on another person's opinion, you're not really a collector. And by the way, when it's based on meaning, who cares how big it is? Um, here's, <laughs> right. my here's my favorite watch. I can't even wear it. It's too small. Who cares? It's what is beautiful. It? It what means it? something. That, it's that it's that, that Lord Elgin. Oh, right, right. It's from, yeah. it's from the 58. Ford, yeah. yeah, and okay. you know, I got this gigantic arm. I should be wearing something this size. <laughs> right. Because it fits. But uh, wearing something that delicate is just not practical. 
But it, again, it's about the meaning. It's a, if it's a collectible, it's collectible to you. But even if it's collectible, it's because it's meaningful. Size sometimes matters, but not always. Right. So another question, uh, can something, uh, something be elegant and beautiful because it's functional? Can extreme beauty be achieved in motion like the Grand Seiko spring drive or hula hoop dancing? What are your thoughts? <laughs> well, that's a sophisticated question. Uh -huh. um, I love the idea of beauty in that. Um, I, I find precision to be very beautiful. So I'll often, I mean, I, I love cars and uh, I'm from Detroit and I just watched that, that movie Ford versus Ferrari. And I was stunned at how at my age, I'm still emotionally moved by the shape of those 1960s cars. Mm -hmm. And I don't think I'm the only one. I think they were invented for guys to look at in the 50s, 60s. And there was this huge leap where beauty that Art Deco swirl or curve was associated with technology and maybe we were brainwashed you know take a look at a rocket from from some science fiction novel from the from the 40s 50s or 60s it's the same thing and so you're appealing to some part of the brain that appreciates technological performance and extreme beauty all in the same thing and then we all say the same thing wow that's a beauty and you know what most people say she's a beauty right huh? can't make that stuff up yeah Absolutely. So uh, I love this one uh, from Tim McDonald. Do you have a watch in mind at the moment that you would like to buy? I, I really want to hear this answer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I got several in mind I'd like to buy. And <laughs> I love that. Well, if I give it away, someone's going to sweep. Somebody's going to swipe it up. Oh, okay. I have recently seen that um, Omega 007 watch, which is really a. Um, inspired from like 25 years ago from one of those 1990s movies it's right here i'm not typically a fan of the 90s movies but boy is that thing beautiful it has the most beautiful um titanium band what, what do you call those bands milanese a milanese it is yeah. absolutely beautiful okay and then well. these seikos I, I love those seikos i would go after seikos is it spring that's uh green huh no no that's summer you have the spring and you have summer. the winter so you need the, uh, the summer and fall to get your box. That's right. Yeah. The summer one would be the next one. It is, it is gorgeous green. I'm a little colorblind, but it's a green that I can see, which which means a lot. I There's think you're, I think you're a, a lot, lot colorblind from my experience. <laughs> 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 so uh, someone asked about your thoughts on the JLC Reverso. Oh, well, those are beautiful. Yeah, they are. Yeah. I, I um, It is one of... I actually keep a collection of watches that I covet. <laughs> and so um, I wouldn't even know which one of those reversals to get, but they are absolutely beautiful. I tend to like the one that's a little bit bigger. I don't know the names of them. But I look at them a lot. Um, I would love an antique one. I would love a modern one that's uh, a little bit bigger. They are absolutely elegant. And anybody that wears one, I would have a hard time seeing somebody wearing it where I would go up to them and say, holy Toledo, that watch is incredible. Those Great. are beautiful. Interesting. Uh, Chi Town, California. My thoughts are that if you have to ask someone else's opinion as to what you should buy, then you are either an investor or you do have or you do not yet know what you really want. Well said. Yeah, absolute. And uh, Dare Stiefel, Detroit in the house! Exclamation point! Exclamation point! And Booser, Doc, uh, what do you think of the theory that media coverage of mass shootings? leads to more mass shootings, changing the topic a little bit here. Now, how did you know that I know about that? Uh, do so, you do? Um, okay. I actually do, yeah. I was on, uh, I was on uh, Ed Norris' show, uh, Nor Long, Norris and Long Show, a couple of years ago talking about this topic. Maybe this person overheard it. Um, they may not know I who Ed, Ed is. Why don't you fill them in on Ed? Ed. Ed, Ed Norris. Yep. Uh, Ed Norris is uh, currently a disc jockey for 105.7, and they have a wonderful show in the morning from 6 to 10 a.m., and it's the number one TV sh uh, radio show in town, and they're the most interesting guys, Rob and Jerry and Ed. I've known Ed for a dozen years. He's a personal friend of mine, but I really enjoy talking to him. Hmm. So once in a while, they invite me on the show, and here's a plug. I'm on tomorrow morning at 7 a.m. I've been on every morning on 105.7 for the last month or so, mm. every Friday morning. 
and we just talk about themes related to adjusting to this disaster. Well, it's interesting. I, I'm on top of the themes of adjusting to this disaster because I've been following either accidentally because of my work or intellectually because I really want to know about these things. And we have been learning more and more and tracking more and more about suicide uh, tendencies. And we've been tracking um, school shooter tendencies. And ironically, there's a lot in common. But the idea of the specific question is really a great question that people don't talk about enough. There is absolute um, scientific evidence that suicides are catchy. That is, um, suicide, the idea of a completed suicide increases the chances of another person committing suicide. Now, that's mm -hmm. not a black and white statement where it's only true. If there are five, seven, ten risk factors, that's one of the risk factors. And so there's all kinds of guidelines about what journalists are supposed to say or not say about that. Now, that's a slam dunk. Sociology research, psychiatric research, psychological research. There is also rising evidence from all of the above that completed the other thing you just said can also increase the chances of it. And so um, because it's not slam dunk science yet, it's hard to talk about because the last thing you want in a pandemic disaster, in a school shooting disaster, et cetera, is to have people giving you the wrong information because it gets too distilled, it gets too this, it gets too that. We can't talk about stuff off the cuff and give people bad, um, bad advice and we can't give people off the cuff and make people too happy. So the long and short of it is, people don't say this word in scientific research, but I think it's based on a meme, M-E-M-E. -E. It means a lot of things to a lot of different people. My kids will tell you that a meme is a joke or a picture, but a meme, according to this guy who invented it, Dawkins, back in the 70s, a meme is a specific particle of an idea that soci sociologically share, spreads like wire, wildfire. And so there's many examples. Uh, a hit music, is based on a meme. If there's a if there's a hook, the hook in a music is literally a, beam, a meme. It replays in your head, the idea shares somewhere else, next thing you know, everybody's listening to it. The thing, the question that the caller asked about is based on some very, very problematic, dark psychological machinery, psychiatric machinery, and sociological machinery. But I wholly believe that there is an idea pellet that is transmitted somehow or another, that the media can be part of it, so they have to be really careful. And that at the center of that idea pellet is an infectious agent that says, this is an option. Um, option is actually the last straw in these cases. Most people don't think these things are an option. Once a person has convinced himself that an action is an option, it increases the chance that they actually complete that. Very, very complicated question. Good answer. Thank you. So uh, this is changing gears again uh, from Gipu. Why has man been attracted to gold since the beginning of time? What is so special about 18 karat yellow gold that can't be emulated in other precious materials? Handle that <laughs> one, Doc. Well, <laughs> well, it's extremely malleable. And uh -huh. because it's extremely malleable, it can be shaped into all kinds of jewelry, uh, tools, bowls, and functional things. But because it's rare, only people with great resources can get it. Like, I'm making this up, right? What do I know about this? But I don't <laughs> think I'm wrong. And so um, it has great value because it is beautiful. Why? Because it is. And because it's soft. And because it conducts electricity spectacularly. And because it's hard to get. And there's a recipe for something. It's beautiful. Yeah. It's functional. And you'll be lucky to get something. Yeah. You can get it here, though. So... Uh, <laughs> Uh, let's see here. Uh, Craig, uh, our host of this channel, here's a stunner for the doc, and I think I know what it is. I cannot uh, uh, flick over to that uh, link uh, with what I have set up here, but uh, I'll show it to him later, Craig. We know, we know what you're talking about. Uh, it ends with 002, I'm sure. So uh, moving on, Leon Eckel asks, what do you think about solar-powered watches with GPS like the Seiko Astron? or Casio Oceanus? Uh, I like those two, but I had to make a conscious decision as a collector that I could not go down every rabbit hole. And so what I've chosen to do is to buy watches that 
sometimes are tool watches and sometimes are just plain old, you know, handsome that I ascribed meaning to and, and stories to. Mm -hmm. So I do not have a high tech watch like that. I absolutely love them. Um, but for some reason, I just don't have them. What I chose to do for my summer watch, uh, I can't give enough to this one, is this uh, Piranha watch, you know, the Zanetti. Uh, it's yeah. uh, got like a three, uh, what is it, a seven millimeter uh, crystal on it? Yeah. I mean, it's that. unbelievable. Yeah. And so this is my only tool watch. It's not like it's going to track me through the woods, but I'm going to tell you the truth. I'm not going anywhere where I'm getting lost. And mm -hmm. so my idea of a tool watch is a watch that I can wear to the pool, bang it on the side, you know, drop it to the bottom and it'll be fine. But I love those high tech watches. I just don't happen to collect them. Right. Okay. So uh, a light, lighter question from Boozer. Uh, what's the best film adaptation of a comic book? Well, that's a good one. Uh, I think that... Um, Gosh, what do I like the best? I actually love that 1989 Batman movie. And the thing about it is it's quirky. And it's not really representative of the com of the Batman mythos per se. You know, there's been so many versions of Batman. Here, let me show you something funny. This is an authentic Batman Halloween mask from 1966. <laughs> <laughs> now, it doesn't fit. I've tried it on 10 times today for the patients. But it's incredible. What did it cost at the time? You know, 79 cents or something like that? Um, back then, you can see the face of whimsy on this, right? Uh, Batman was very whimsical in the 50s and 60s. Very whimsical when that uh, Batman TV show came on. And I adore that Batman TV show. It's beautiful. It's just, it hits everything right. But it invented its own way. 89 Batman is cool because Michael Keaton is incredibly intense and variable like batman he can be unstable he can be scary he can be calculating he can be charming you know he really nails the character and maybe the tim burton movies can get a little bit um, quirky sometimes but i really like that adaptation but you got to go to the modern ones i just love uh infinity war um because the just everything about it i think is right and the feel is right um i uh, that's the one that's my favorite version Okay, great. So, um, Doc, your take on cigars. Remember our uh, our introductory photos with us with cigars. So, tell us about <laughs> your cigar thing. Well, I find that when I'm palling around with people, you know, guys are predictable. Guys that like cigars tend to like bourbon. Guys that tend to like bourbon and cigars like to talk cars and like to talk about watches. <laughs> so <laughs> next thing you know, you got a sample bias. Yeah. But the combination of bourbon and cigar, um, and, and believe me, I'm not good at overdoing anything. I'm world's biggest lightweight. I cannot drink well. But I do mm. enjoy a good bourbon. Um, mm. I can't handle beer. Too, too heavy. But a bourbon is spectacular and a cigar is spectacular. Ironically, uh, as you know, I'm colorblind. But I do pick up tones and richness, so I'm a big expert on earth tones. And so uh, I can look at a bourbon and tell you if it's a good taste, and I can look at a, at, at a tobacco uh, of a cigar and tell you if it's my brand. I currently like fairly rich, fairly heavy bourbons and cigars. Liga Privada is my new favorite. And okay. uh, number nine, just love the heck out of it. It's one of the best cigars ever. Okay. And... Uh... Leon, back to that, I think uh, Gipu is challenging Craig's belief that only yellow gold is true gold. He does not like white gold. That's Craig. So, okay, just uh, probably doesn't require a comment. And here's a question. Doc, is it healthy for someone who really wants a Rolex but can't afford to buy, uh, can't afford to buy it to buy an homage like Steinhardt? Wait, what's the question again? Is it what? Is it healthy for someone who really wants a Rolex but can't afford it to buy an homage watch like Steinhardt? Well, <laughs> I love it. Um, I think that it is never appropriate to buy something, anything that you can't afford because the ramifications of you bought something and you can't afford it are just awful. And so um, it all depends on what are you looking for. For instance, somebody had brought up some of those high-tech uh, Seiko watches, and um, I don't know what the highest 
technology, high-tech watches, but I'm always blown away at how reasonably affordable those watches are. The Casio they mentioned, mm. that, uh, that Seiko that they mentioned. And so you don't need to have meaning, utility, beauty. It doesn't mean you need to buy a $15,000 Rolex. If you can afford it, congratulations. If you can invest in it and guarantee a return on it, congratulations. But that's pretty, pretty whatever. If you want a nice watch, go find the nicest watch you like. Uh, everything else appeals. It doesn't matter what anyone else thinks. It's not like we're I'm not like Steve's going to judge you or I'm going to judge you. It's the watch you like. You secretly like it because you like it, and then you're going to show me because it's cool. And I'm going to say that's cool. And if you buy an homage watch, okay, it's good to me. Do you like it? I, I like it too. Those things are beautiful. Okay, great. So Tom Austin says hi, and uh, uh, Carlos, hi, hello, Tom. Gipu, I agree with Craig on 100% of everything, as should anyone else on this channel. That's very true. And I'm sure that our guest agrees with Craig, too. So, <laughs> uh, next uh, comment. I think the eight, nine, this is from Leon. I think the 1989 Batman movie was based on the killing joke. I think the true star of that movie was Jack Nicholson. Any comment? No? Yeah. Well, you know, it is. Fair to say that the more compelling characters in the entire Batman mythos are the villains. And so it is okay to say that. So who's more interesting, Batman or the Joker? It's always the Joker. Mm. Um, for the record, I think that the Heath Ledger version um, surpassed that uh, Jack Nicholson version for me. And that's saying a lot because that was incredible. But um, I like the scary aspect of the Joker more than I like the clownish aspect which is what the Nicholson version was excellent because he was spooky because Nicholson can do that. But um, I think Heath Ledger leapt into the territory of terrorist and interpersonal terrorist and community terrorist. He just let, he just went into orbit with that ability to be that menacing. I thought that was incredible. Um, but, but you're right. That's another reason why 89 movie is so good. The killing joke thing is interesting. There's a lot of debate about whether or not um, Alan Moore and John Boland, who are the artist and the writer of that, whether or not they think that that storyline in, in the graphic novel, whether or not it actually aged well, and whether or not it told the stories. I know, I know from reading that both of them have regrets about some of the violence that they put into it. And there's been recolorings, and they're trying to like retool things to try to make it more digestible. But um, while the Killing Boat joke was similar in timeline to that movie, I don't think it's, I'm not even sure it's inspiring of it. I think Burton uh, became a Batman fan after a fashion and then he used his own creativity because it, it just jumps out that that's a Tim Burton movie. Great. So uh, Gipu asks, what, kind, what type of colorblindness? <laughs> no, I am so colorblind <laughs> that I don't even pay attention to it. Here's what I know. Can you see the yellow in my room? behind me the walls mm. the walls can yeah. you see the yellow yes i can see the yellow yeah i can see yellow i can see orange and half the time i can see blue um i can't see blue if it's close to purple and i can't tell purple if it's close to blue mm. i have no idea what the lawn looks like the lawn is a rich color sometimes mm. i think it's orange Sometimes I think it's gold. I have no idea what lawn green is. No idea. I don't even have a reference point. And so my understanding of, of red blind, I think of more red, blue color blind, or excuse me, red green than anything else. Mm -hmm. My understanding is it's based on too many receptors and too much overlap. So when you get a significant richness of signal from red, it lights up green too because they overlap and they're not supposed to overlap. But in my brain, they overlap. Mm -hmm. or my, I, my retina, I should say, they overlap. And so what I really like are colors I can see. I have a blue car that could not be more blue. Um, it's Mazzano Blue Alfa Romeo Stelvio. I, I can see it from a mile away. And it's because mm. it's got no purple, no nothing. It's blue. I can see the primary colors. And here's a circular conversation. No wonder I like comic books. The old comic books were printed in what they called four colors. Primary plates overlapping, maybe some purple, maybe some green, maybe some orange, but mostly, you know, Superman's hair is a little bit of black and a lot of blue because it prints better that way. Flat, high contrast primary colors, love it. 
this room would give you a headache probably, Steve. But it's, <laughs> right. got, it's got all kinds of primary. It's a very interesting room. And uh, just for those of you who can't see the entire thing, it is full of this stuff. It would blow. It's, <laughs> it's like a museum. Unbelievable. Anyway, uh, uh, we have a lot of questions here going up. Uh, da, oh, so Dave Williams says cigars implies whiskey implies watches. Logical. Yep, good comment. And Chi Town, California. Doc, what are some lessons about superheroes we could learn from T'Challa in the Black Panther? Oh, th th that's a great one. Um, T'Challa, um, the character originally orig came out in um, um, Fantastic Four back in, I don't know, maybe 1965 or so. And over time, the character has just gotten better and better. It's not always true that the character gets better over time, but that T'Challa character gets better and better. I, I think that's a great movie, too. Um, any of the Marvel movies, any of the superhero movies, just has that whole coming-of-age thing to it. And so... Um, what, the character that you meet is already kind of fully formed. You know, the character T'Challa is already so fleshed out. He has already arrived as the Black Panther by the time the first scene happens. And then he becomes the Black Panther because the trauma event of losing your father in the first scene makes you have to leap from being fully capable, extremely powerful, extremely capable leader towards the, the Black Panther position. So in the hero's journey... Um, it literally always starts off with death of a parent. Um, it's analogous to being an orphan. And so any of the, any of the good superheroes, and people have tried, have tried, have argued with me this before, more superheroes than you know are orphans. Captain America is an orphan. If you don't believe me, look it up. But all of the greats are orphans because they're all following the same story. So T'Challa is a great character. By the way, I love that actor. And um, – when he loses his dad, it begins the hero's journey for him because then he has to uh, rise, ascend to it, ready or not. You know, watch the movie enough times. He really is ready, but he's also a peaceful person. And so I don't know if you've ever had this experience. Um, what's it like to be peaceful and then you're put in a situation where you have to be violent? Um, I was a wrestler for many years. Steve, you're a wrestler too, right? Yeah, absolutely. We never got it on though. And not anymore. I'm no, a little too old. The, right, the knees have all cut it. I'm a lot too old. Yeah. But one of the things that I struggled with uh, being a wrestler, and I was told this, and I carried this burden for many years, is I didn't have any killer instinct. Uh, I wasn't, I wasn't going to hurt anybody. And so the next tier, high-end Division One wrestling in college, you have to be brutal. You have to be efficient, but you have to be fearless and not be afraid to hurt somebody. And I was never going there. And so I really appreciate the scene in T'Challa in the uh, Black Panther when he is called upon in the typical Rocky fight. He's beaten and bludgeoned, but he's so resilient and he's so strong of will that when he should be dead, he's going to persevere. But the thing that's subtle about that is you have to find a capacity for violence. And that character, what makes him great in the book, comic book and in the movie, is he's not a fight first character. In fact, none of them are. Um, Hulk, maybe. But even then, it's only when he's overwhelmed. And so I love that story, too. The superheroes generally don't want to be depicted punching somebody in the nose. You have the ability, but the truest definition of power, if there's such a thing, is that you never have to wield it. And so most of the superheroes try to get by with who wants to use physical force. That's a good, that's a good rule of thumb. That's a good message for your kids. But even if you had the capacity for extreme violence, who wants to use it? Can't we just do something else? <laughs> and so uh, I think that plays out in that movie, but that's a great movie. Okay. So here's a trapdoor question. Uh, thoughts on Tudor watches, please. Don't say it's beautiful. Wrench gang on standby. Wrench gang can sort of knock you off the chat here. <laughs> T tell me why you think it's a trapdoor question. Uh, uh, because it's a question that... Uh, comes up in this uh, channel and uh, it's a little controversial. Uh, there are those that really uh, are uh, unhappy with Tudor watches and some uh, promote them. So I, I guess, you know, um, from my studies, um, I guess the biggest criticism is that they're Rolex light. And so, you know, I can point to cigars and say, I love Liga Privada and they're the best dang cigars I've ever smoked. 
But you know, there's another brand. It's called uh, Under. Oh gosh, I'm having a, 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 a senior moment here. It's called Under Brand. It's the same company using the same ingredients with a different wrapper, and it's about half as much. Mm. And by golly, that Maduro Under Crown. It's called Under Crown. Under Crown Maduro is incredible. And as far as a ten dollar cigar, it's the best ten dollar cigar. It's not the best twenty dollar cigar. That's the Liga. So mm-hmm. it's interesting that I could love them both, and nobody I know would criticize me because who needs to smoke twenty dollar cigars? So I'm using that as an analogy for Tudor and for um, Rolex. If Rolex didn't exist, I would really like those Tudors. That being said, I got a couple of Rolexes, but I don't have a Tudor. I mm. do covet, and this is one of the next watches I would buy if I had permission and I had some extra money. I love the Black Bay Bronze. Mm. And I would have to compare the two because I believe there's two. Heritage, maybe, something else, something else. One has a greener face and a a better band. And the other one has a gray-black face and a black band. And I would have to put them next to each other to tell them apart. Mm -hmm. But I think I want the one with the green face. I love that bronze watch more than any other bronze watch. Except for, of course, my Zanetti special made bronze watch. Mm -hmm. That's a different conversation. But I love that watch. Okay. So we're back uh, with Leon on white gold. Uh, white gold is the grand Seiko of precious metals. It is valuable, but uh, only you know it is, just like grand Seiko. Oh, that's a good good comment. And uh, Leon also asked, did you buy any of the Marvel Comics Citizen watches, which we have here in the store, oh, by the way? <laughs> that's interesting. Um, I have not bought any of those, but that's because I had some sense of uh, sated appetite when I bought all of those pens. <laughs> oh, right, right. Okay. I just found those the other day. I forgot how beautiful those things are. Those the Mardi Gras pens. pens. Oh, those are incredible. Yeah. Um, I have not bought the Citizen ones. I can't put them in my brain what they're supposed to be. They're a little bit special for a low-end watch, and they're not quite the mechanical high-end watch that I want. And mm-hmm. So it just doesn't fit into my, my vision. But I like them. I do enjoy looking at them. Okay, so um, here's a questionable comment. Uh, that's the same color blindness as dogs. You only see in blue and yellow. Hmm. <laughs> moving but on. <laughs> yeah, moving on. Um, Doc, are there real health implications if you smile smile a cigar once a month? I think uh, you got a little autocorrect there. Uh, smoke a cigar once a month. It may not be his thing, but he might have an opinion. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, nobody thinks that cigars are good for you. And um, that being said, I, you know, I still smoke them sometimes. And, and I didn't start smoking until I hit about 50. And I said to myself, <laughs> I'm day to day. I don't know about you, but when I turned 50, I realized not just the concept of mortality, but, you know, when you're 50, you might die. And what a weird way to see the world. So me acting out midlife crisis is I'm going to start smoking cigars. That being said, when you go for a physical and you're being screened for this and that, life insurance, whatever, I believe that the value, the number they're looking for is do you smoke more than one or two a month? And if you smoke less than one or two a month, they're fine. And if you smoke more than one or two a month, then they're a little bit nervous that it might have health implications. Mm-hmm. I mean, zero smoking is the ideal. Whether or not you have family history of or not, there are other factors, but you got to juggle these types of things. I can't say that one a month is innocent. I just think that's a cutoff based on other people who use it as a cutoff. Okay. Um, Boozer uh, remarks, in the Walking Dead show slash comic, Glenn is brutally killed by Nagan, and the audience reacted with anger and despair. I don't get it. Don't these people know it's just a story? <laughs> that, by the way, is a great storyline with Negan in the right in the in the actual comic book graphic novel, and also in the movie because it's the character is just so villainous. And so, you know, starting twenty plus years ago with the Sopranos, suddenly um, entertainment is really satisfying when it's full of either antiheroes or actual villains mm-hmm. because. One wants to find something 